I feel like what Tesla is working on and the reason why it has the fan base it has and why it has the attention it has, it's because they've identified industries that are unbelievably ripe for disruption that if done correctly, open up incredibly gigantic TAMs. And for some reason in this country or just society is incapable of visualizing that that could actually be reality. Right. Be- even though we've had countless historical examples in the past of technologies that have come through and completely reinvented society, the railroad, the automobile, the printing press, right? Don't get like fire was the OG, okay? We've had insane technologies that come through and they just transformed the world. So so how do you view the, the sort of Musk sort of industry through that lens? Do you, what, what kind of lens do you use when you're thinking about the numbers that I'm sure your, your model spit out? And these are gigantic numbers, right? You're like, okay, like, can this even be real? So like, walk me through that thought process. Yeah, it's, it's been really interesting for us that because a lot of people have accused me of all kinds of things and called me all kinds of names, uh, even recently, you know, as, as yesterday. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Right, it just continues, right? <laughs> it's fine. And, and I've always maintained that I'm I'm going to be completely wrong, but I think directionally we're right. Yeah. Right. I, you know, I, I, my models, you know, throw out certain price targets, and people like to focus on certain numbers. That's not why I'm building the model to generate a price target. It's just kind of an output from the model. I'm building the models to better understand the economic drivers of Tesla and what the opportunity might look like. And I always invite people to to plug in their own numbers. While I don't share my underlying model, I share enough of my model so that people could build their own. It's Mm -hmm. not really that complicated. And I like to show that and have people think about this on their own and plug in their own numbers, test different assumptions, and see what the output is. One of the big criticisms from traditional analysts, fund managers... Uh, we all know one in the community. I won't mention his name. That just doesn't shout out quite. Gary Black. <laughs> He's my buddy. I love him. <laughs> we we discovered everything. Be. He's my buddy. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny because I I had some conversations with him before he blocked me um, about sort of what the future might look like, mm-hmm. right, with the humanoid robot. And one of his fallback comments is always, "Well, where's your demand model? Where's the demand going to come from?" And it's pretty hard to have a demand model for a product that doesn't yet exist. Right. Right. And so we've kind of reached this impasse between him saying, well, if it doesn't yet exist, there is no demand model. There is no value. Okay. Right. Do, does yeah. that make you go what? crazy when you hear that? Like, does it make you go crazy? Because to me, it's like, I, I don't know if it's like something like my brain's wired a certain way. But when I hear that, I'm like, how is the demand? How is the demand not the most obvious thing on the planet? Right. Right. Yeah. What, what's the demand model for Moore's law? How can you model using demand that we're going to just increase compute, uh, you know, very, very consistently yeah. from the 1960s onward? What do you think is a blockade there, CERN? Like what, what's what's the thing that prevents that type of like, is it just a, a, a um, an absolute sort of like, um, like, are they just beholden to having to have the numbers solidified for them to be able to model? Is it like just a, a total inadvertent? Like, are they just afraid to project into the future the likeliest outcomes? Do they just not work with statistics? Like, what what do you think that is? I think the number one thing I would say is that Wall Street is very short-term focused, right? They will look out a year, maybe two years if you're lucky. Yeah. Right. And as we get to this point in the year, they're looking at 2026 numbers, right? So it's definitely 18 months out. Right. And that's what Wall Street prices in. And if you're on Wall Street and you look out beyond that, you're, you're not really going to be rewarded for that because typically stock prices do not look out that far. Mm-hmm. And we've seen this time and time again with every single innovative company you can point a stick at. at the last great example, I think, is NVIDIA. Jensen was very clear about the direction of that company and what was coming. No one listened to him. They were all worried about the, the sales of their gaming chip. Right. And after COVID, there was a post COVID decline. Stock lost a lot of money. Right. And and Jensen kept reminding us that this AI boom's coming right around the corner. And then all of a sudden, boom, it hit. And analysts spent the next couple of years chasing the stock. Mm. And I think the same thing is highly likely to happen to Tesla when they have that moment. 
Yeah. And, and what's, what's interesting about that, right? It's, it's, you know, I, I do sometimes wonder, so Elon has a track record of being late, sometimes very late, but he's also correct on a lot of different variables, especially the, the big picture ones that are, that are the most esoteric. Those are the ones that he usually lands dead on. Reusable rockets, profitable yep. electric vehicles, mass market electric vehicles, brain chip, right? These are things that are just like are are, are hard to fathom at the time ridiculous when they get introduced. Scales of batteries. Ex- a ridiculous right. ex- scales of batteries. Ex- a ridiculous scale of training compute. Ridiculous scale of of self driving vehicles, right? These are like almost insane things. And I wonder like, you know, has there been a history of, of leaders, public CEOs that maybe have made promises and they've under delivered or they've never delivered that has trained wall street to sort of like say, okay, well, we're not going to price it in until, until it happens. Or it could just be like a risk management thing, right? To your point, if these guys are modeling six to 18 months in the future and they are dealing with other people's money by default, they're not going to properly uh, come up with a model that is honest about the st- statistical likelihood of a of a of a of a huge upswing in 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 a company's valuation because of what they're working on. That's going to become real five years from now. So it's like they they are just incongruent, right? Like those two things just don't play nice together. And so and so it, I wonder if Wall Street's just always destined to just always miss Nvidia, always miss. Tesla, always miss Palantir, Robinhood, Lemonade in some respects, Coinbase probably, right? I, I just, you know, I think about that a lot. And it's like, that is one of the, you know, because, because again, like we talked about before, like I, I, I read the stuff that comes through. And of course, it's like, I always try to have like a, like a system that says, okay, are you, are you losing your mind? Are you losing your mind? Are you losing your mind? And the answer is always, Yes, but not in this respect. Yes, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am losing my mind, but not in this specific thing. So I don't know. I don't know if that's something that you you, you share and like something you run into as well. I'd, I'd love to hear your take on that. I think there's always opportunity and disruption, and I'm actually kind of surprised because Wall Street is constantly being disrupted. They've been disrupted in so many ways, and yet Wall Street has survived. But you would think in the in this age of highly knowledgeable retail investors, right? I think particularly for Tesla and Palantir and some other companies, the retail community understands these companies better than the professional analyst community does. Yeah. Which is amazing. We've we've never seen that before. And then I would also say that there's some sort of non-traditional uh, professionals out there now. And ARK Invest, I think, is probably the leading candidate in, in that space as, as far as it goes for Tesla. Yeah. And you would think in the face of those two forces, that that would wake up Wall Street and say, oh my gosh, we better mend our ways here and approach this a little differently. And yet we haven't really seen that yet. And so I don't know what that will take. Um, But I guess eventually if they feel like enough of their turf is being taken, they're going to have to fight back in that, in in that way. And and you know, that that's super interesting because that makes companies like Robinhood as an example, their future probably looks extremely bright because the ultimate the ultimate forcing function for Wall Street to really wake up is less money to invest, less fees being made from clients, right? That's and right. if there's a flight away from from your usual firms or whatever you want to call that are just not having the same returns as somebody with a Robinhood app and going on a forum and watching YouTube videos for a two weeks straight and absorbing everything and then having the diligence of like doing the the DD and sitting down and making the investment and actually being patient and allowing the thesis to play out and constantly test the thesis every day. Right. Like th- that's the retail. I feel like that's the retail playbook is like study for study for weeks to months, potentially make sure you have everything you think you have figured out down pat, make your investment. And then every day recheck the thesis. Is this still happening? Is this still happening? Still, this it's happening. And then you know, you you tell yourself, I am okay if I have to wait five years. I'm okay if I have to wait ten years. But that requires the time to do the research, the patience, right? To actually like <laughs> to actually uh, see the story play out, and a lack of ego to constantly ask yourself, Am I dumb? Did I just make a mistake? Did I just make a mistake? Did I just make a mistake? Right? And I think and, you know, and the emotional yeah. regulation not to freak out. 
or yeah. or get too excited, you know, either one. Yeah. Which I think is the hardest part for any investor. And I think that's partly why Wall Street tends to be, you know, fairly short-term focused. Mm. Because if you allow yourself to dream, then suddenly you can get yourself into trouble because you, you've dreamed so big, right? And you're a fund manager and you're at the end of the year saying, well, I had a bad year this year, but you know what? Five years from now, it's going to be great. That's not really going to work well for your investors for your own compensation for the company that you work for. So yeah. because they're on that quarterly annual kind of compensation scheme, they have to deliver results in those time periods. So Whereas how retail is it, investors aren't constrained in, in that way. How is it that Ron Barron has managed to kind of skirt that dynamic that you're talking about? Because mm. he, you know, is one of the best fund managers on Wall Street. And at the same time, he does, you know, make some of those longer term investments uh, and allows them to play out over time. Like, is it his fund construction to where different, like it's uncorrelated enough to where different things are winning at different times. So he's able to produce consistent results, even when part of, you know, the investment thesis is taking longer to play out or does he have a different structure that allows him to, you know, just survive when, the fund isn't performing as well as, you know, some other things or how, how does that work for someone like Ron Barron? Yeah. The Barron funds is, is a, you know, a mutual fund complex with a number of different funds, different strategies. So there are not, not all the funds are, you know, heavily invested in Tesla or, you know, other, other companies are very diversified. Um, his fund family, his investment management company has been around for a long time. I, I don't know how many years it is. It's been, it's, but it's been a very long time. And he's at the point now where I think a lot of the money is his own. And of course, he's also got a number of very mm. patient, wealthy friends. And so I think it's just a combination of he's been in business so long, he's proved himself. People now give him the benefit of the doubt. They see his results. And, you know, I would say in the last decade, he's done some amazing things. But maybe for the first 30 years, he was kind of wandering in the woods, relatively speaking. Yeah. Right. So it's like it's like a combination of proven track record and then instilling a culture with your clients. Right. So it's like usually you would think in a in a typical organization, the most successful ones, which which I think is becoming a trend that sort of uh Elon, I think, has popularized, mm -hmm. which is a an existential mission is your best, like it's your best variable forcing function, whatever you want to use to attract the filter. best possible partners, filter. Yep. The best to attract the best possible uh, humans around you. So you can actually execute against your goal. And I think in, you know, in investing, if you're a firm, I feel like that would apply the same way. And probably that's why Baron is, is where he's at, right? It's, it's the, he, the, his clients have the same culture as him, which is like, I trust you and you can, I'm willing to wait as long as you, you think it's right. Right. And then let's go. And then that's that's very different than, you know, I, I, I guess it's very different from how usual firms were, which is like, I want to I want this to, number go big. Why number no go big? <laughs> right? I feel like it's, it's a much simpler thing. And it sort of removes the 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 art, almost like the art and the the work that's required to actually find investments that are life changing in, in the future and actually like. Are, are make a huge impact to your ability to reach your financial goals and whatever. And I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm just like, I, I, like, no. I just think about this all the time, you know, because it's, it is very interesting. The other thing yeah. too, I think that Ron Barron and his team does exceptionally well is they recognize how important the leaders of these companies are. And so to my knowledge, you know, Ron Barron has been very successful in investing in companies like Charles Schwab, right. And that's been a long-term investment. Um, mm -hmm and some of the gaming stocks and knowing some of the people behind those companies. And so he's very focused on the leadership of a company and he invests in people and less so, I think, the business. Mm. Right. And of course, that's a critical element for Elon. You know, I think, you know, as, as you see, as far as, uh, you know, Elon has delivered longer term, he might miss yeah. some of the timelines. But if you're invested with a guy like that, 
over the long term, he's going to do exceptionally well. And I think Ron Barron's done an, an incredible job over the years of identifying other very successful business leaders. Whereas Across I, I feel a like host a lot of, of Wall Street focuses just on the numbers, and he's focused more on the people. Yeah, Hans, you said across a host of in- industries, right? Yeah, um, yeah. It, it's not just in tech, or you know, and I think that's one of the really important things. You know, either either that's a superpower hack, you know, to be able to identify mm. those different people across different disciplines. Like, you know, how do you check whether they're brilliant or actually just full of crap? If you aren't an industry expert in all of those things, I think that's, you know, something that's very difficult. Um, And yeah, he seems to have gotten that down pretty well. 